Hey, Crystal. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, thanks. It's great to see you. Good to see you as well. I'm going to mute myself, though. Okay, thank you, Connie. Hello? Hi, Jolly. Can you, can you hear me? All right, so we will go ahead and get started with our program and a few of our colleagues will continue to trickle in. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for joining us for our first session of the First Fridays with Fairbanks series. The First Fridays with Fairbanks series is made possible by the IU Alumni Association and the Richard M. Fairbanks School of Public Health Alumni Board. The Alumni Association will host a live Zoom event featuring a Fairbanks student and faculty member running from January through May. Each session will be recorded for individuals interested in the topic but unable to join us. I'm Tom Loftus, a first year Master of Public Health Epidemiology student here at Fairbanks. Today, I'll be speaking with Dr. Jolly Han, who serves as a professor and epidemiology department chair for the school. Dr. Han and I will be speaking about the emerging field of precision health and its epidemiological implications. Precision health represents the intersection between various disciplines, genomics, informatics, and medicine, to name a few, and requires interprofessional collaboration in order to be effective across clinical care and research environments. In public health, we find ourselves primarily working in prevention, but what if we played a role in individually tailoring patient treatment plans and therapeutics down the line? To answer this question, we can and we do. A precision approach takes this other side of the equation into account, a space we typically don't find ourselves occupying and is largely considered to be the way of the future because of its promise. Throughout the event, please utilize the chat box below. Clicking the chat option will open a chat box on either the right side or center of your screen. This is where you should type out questions for Dr. Han or myself or to initiate a conversation with other participants. Once you finish typing your question, hit enter and feel free to either exit out of the chat box or leave it open to keep an eye on side discussions that may be happening during the session. We are hoping for a robust conversation and we will be referring to questions at the halfway point of the session and at its conclusion. We'll be monitoring your questions and we'll try to get to them all. A few reminders about using Zoom today. We have automatically turned off your microphone and will attempt to keep everyone muted except for those speaking. We appreciate your willingness to connect virtually. On that note, let's get started. As I mentioned, Dr. Han serves as both a professor of epidemiology and epidemiology department chair here at the Fairbanks School of Public Health. Additionally, Dr. Han enjoys appointments at the Indiana University Simon Cancer Center as the Rachel Cecilia Froymson Professor of Cancer Research and at Indiana University School of Medicine in the Department of Dermatology. Students are lucky enough to benefit from Dr. Han's genetic expertise, employing a molecular approach to chronic diseases, cancers, and their respective distributions. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Han. Thank you, Tom, for the nice introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. Happy New Year. Great honor to be here. See so many people in the audience. Let's get started. Let me share my screen, have the, uh, the slides show. And I think uh, I already have it ready right here. Great. Can you see my uh, screen for the presentation? Tom, can you hear it? Yep. You I see can. it? Okay, great. So uh, Tom asked me to talk about precision health. So uh, I will not get into too much of the concept or uh, I. Today, I mainly share some of the examples, the daily life examples, so you can feel it touch our daily life. It's very close to us. So previously, people talk about the precision medicine, personalized medicine. Like Tom mentioned earlier, when we talk about the medicine, it's mainly for treatment. And now we change the word to health. It also include the prevention part of our health. And uh, today I will give you some examples. Let's start with the first one, okay? For people who study public health, 
people study epidemiology, we understand that we study the disease distribution in the population. We talk about the association between exposure and the disease, the risk factors for disease. Here is one quick example. The uh, cigarette smoking is a, one of the most important risk factors for lung cancer. We can say cigarette smoking is associated with increased risk of lung cancer, and it's also a causal factor. We can say smoking cause lung cancer. Very few association study you can make at the causality statement, but this is the case. But think about the bigger picture. Only 14% of smokers get the lung cancer eventually. The rest of them don't. And uh, if you have uh, two individuals have the same exact pattern, amount, frequency of cigarette smoking, may one, one person may get a lung cancer, another person didn't. And you can see in, after you uh, inhale the smoke in your lung, you have like an internal dose of the carcinogens from the cigarette smoking, but some people can get rid of this internal carcinogen faster than the other person. So you may have, you, you may end up with different dose of like internal carcinogen, even though you have the same amounts of exposure. Okay, that's one layer. The second layer is we were born with different DNA repair capacity. Some people have sufficient DNA repair capacity. Some people don't may have like a suboptimal or insufficient DNA repair capacity. Some people repair the damage sooner, faster than the other. So that's another layer. If you have cumulative carcinogen, you won't be repaired them quickly. You may end up with a, a lot of damage in your lung cells. You may lead to lung cancer development. You have a higher risk of getting lung cancer. So how you think about a, a precision health, I would say use the traditional saying, one size does not fit all. Okay, so and this, our human body is a black box. We get something exposure, we get a different outcome of the disease. The epidemiology, now we can use the genetic tool and the molecular tool to open this black box between the exposure and the disease. Let me give you another example. Oh, you just have a holiday season, okay? People gotta drink, okay? Some people, the face turn red after the drink, even a little bit, including myself. Okay, so people wonder, why is that? Okay, you Google, you can learn a lot from Google and YouTube, okay? They give you very good answer. The people who flush when they drink may have faulty version of a gene may translate into an enzyme that break down the substance in the alcohol. This is a toxic alcohol. So if a uh, uh, toxic, a uh, uh, substance in the al alcohol. So if you have too much of this, it's caused the red face and other symptoms, including long-term like hypertension and some like discomfort after drinking. So the gene can explain my red face. So give you a little bit of background about this the gene. So people wonder where this faulty version of gene come from? Genes come from our parents. Human, we have a pair of chromosome. Chromosome is the place where the DNA are located, okay? In our cell, okay? each individual have a pair of chromosomes. On the chromosomes, we have over 20,000 genes, okay? So each gene, we have a pair. One from your mother, one from your father. So you can see your mother pick up one randomly in the egg and uh, pass on to you. Your father have, you know, one of the, the, the pairs get into the sperm and then you have a pair, one from one copy from your mom, one copy from your dad. You cannot choose your parents. You cannot choose which copy they pass on you, okay? This is where the genes come from. So if you have a, you pass on a slow uh, 
version from your mom and dad, you have a slow, slow form. Okay. If you have a fast form from your mom and dad, you have a fast form. Maybe you have one slow form from one of your parents, fast form from the other parents, then you will be called heterozygous. You will be intermediate. Okay. So you'll be slow, 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 fast, fast, fast. That's where this come from. So the bottom message is if you have this um, a faulty gene, you won't be able to get rid of the toxic substance in the alcohol to get into the non-toxic form, you get a red face. But some other people can convert the toxic uh, substance into the non-toxic form quickly. You won't have red face. So that's where this come from. Can, you know, gene can explain our, you know, like a phenotype like this. People may wonder, okay, hold on. Like there are some like beneficial effects of uh, alcohol consumption, at least what I learned from like a medium or, you know, press release for some of the research. So let's talk about another example around the alcohol. So moderate alcohol consumption is part of a healthy diet because alcohol can stimulate the liver to produce HDL. HDL is a form of good cholesterol versus the LDL is a bad cholesterol, okay? HDL, the higher, the better to protect your heart. So, you, you know, alcohol consumption stimulate HDL level and uh, decrease the risk of heart disease. In this research, is myocardial infarction, okay? So this is another gene, it's called the ADH3 gene. It's a different gene responsible for red face. It's also in the alcohol meta metabolism pathway. You can see this uh, simplified uh, uh, figure. The top part is HDL level. The bottom one is the risk of uh, MI, myocardial infarction. So the, the left bean is the non-drinker, okay? Less than one drink a day here. The uh, uh, right uh, bean is the uh, uh, drinker. Uh, more than one drink a day is like a glass of wine, something like that. So you can see the uh, in the non-drinkers, no matter which type of gene you have, you have a fast form, intermediate form, or slow form, there's no change in terms of HDL production because you have no alcohol uh, like stimulation here. But among drinkers, okay, in the right beans, we have three groups. You can see if you have slow form, you benefit the most. This stimulates the liver to produce most uh, amounts of HDL and which translate into the decreased risk of myocardial infarction, which is the bottom figure, as you can see here. And the, um, among the non-drinkers, okay, there's not much protection. Among the drinkers, only the people with the slow form have a dramatic risk reduction, almost like by 80% risk reduction for myocardial infarction. So this gives you another sense of a gene exposure interaction. You need a gene, you need exposure to see the effects. So if you don't drink, no beneficial effects in terms of HDL production or I might pre uh, prevention. If you uh, drink, only if you have the gene give you the beneficial effects, okay? This leads to another notion of a benefit risk balance because, you know, like a excessive um, alcohol consumption is bad, okay? Especially it leads to cancer development, for example, breast cancer. So this is the, the balance. Should I drink alcohol to protect my heart at the risk of the cancer development? I think it depends on the genes. If you have this slow form, you benefit the most from, uh, from alcohol consumption in terms of uh, protect, uh, protecting your heart. 
So, you know, the reason I give, up, give this example is because we understand the gene cause disease, the treatment based on the genetic profile. You heard this, you know, in, in many stories. But today I give you example. They, the genes also de determine our behavior, our lifestyles. I give you the example of smoking, alcohol consumption. And also there's another example in smoking, uh, cigarette smoking. So when we smoke, we have the uh, uh, nicotine level in our blood. Uh, in the blood is called cotinine. Okay, the cotinine level in the blood get elevated. You feel saturated. Okay, but for people have the fast form of enzyme to get rid of nicotine from your body, you crave for the second round of cigarette smoking pretty quickly. Okay, you have to you have to smoke frequently enough to maintain the kidney level in your blood. So you smoke more, versus other people who have a slow form of enzyme to get rid of cotinine or nicotine from your body. You don't crave for cigarette smoking that often. So even the frequency of smoking, the amounts of smoking, is can determined partially by genes. So coffee consumption. You know, we identify coffee consumption is also linked to uh, gene. Perpetual coffee consumption, like uh, so some genes re, uh, can explain this. I think it's not how much you like it. I think it's like how much you can tolerate it, okay? So one, some people drink one cup of coffee, get the heartbeat goes up, cannot stand. Some people drink six cup of coffee, have no problem, they can sleep with coffee. So you can see the huge variation in terms of the uh, coffee consumption in the population. Eating happy, eating style, your taste, you like salty food, sweet food, there's all genetic component uh, under this, how much you can exercise, how much you like exercise, and there are many more. So you can see our lifestyle have a strong genetic component uh, into it. So uh, I think I give you some examples. Maybe I can stop here to answer some of the questions you have. So I will give you more examples uh, in the uh, second half of my uh, uh, talk. So maybe I give to Tom. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Han. Uh, so I do have some questions of my own, but if anybody has any about slides that were just presented, feel free to chime in or submit those in the chat box or send them to me. Um, I'll go ahead and keep an eye out on those. But going along um, with some examples, what are some really prominent examples here at Fairbanks of this kind of work being done, whether it's by you or faculty member, what do you see kind of encompassing these principles that's either in the works or has been going on for a few years? Yeah, uh, majority of this will be in the second part of my talk, but uh, uh, briefly, like uh, in these days, if you study epidemiology, you know, you have to add some molecular and genetic component into this in order to get federal funding. So like uh, most of our faculty in the Department of Epidemiology get into the genetic and the molecular basis, either to predict the, the, the risk of disease or the treatment of the disease. Not necessarily use the notion of a precision health, but adding the genetic and the molecular aspect into the research question is, is, is the way to go. Yeah. So I will give you examples like what happened in our department later in my talk. Great, I think that'll be really beneficial. Um, we have a question in the chat, so I can go ahead and read that off. Uh, thank you for chiming in. In terms of precision health, what role does epigenetics play in lifestyle factors or biological mechanisms? Epigenetics is a very important aspect of genetic research. I'm not sure if you know how many people in the audience understand epigenetics to make a story Simple. It's like uh, even we inherited a gene from our parents, which we cannot change, but the way we express our gene can be changed. Okay, so like uh, we have uh, one copy, but at the DNA level, 
but we can change the expression level of the, this gene. We can have a, a small like a enzyme, like amount of enzyme produced from this gene. We can have a lot of a lot of copy of enzyme from this gene. Even the genetic code does not change, but epigenetics is the way to change the gene expression. The how much we produce these genes, the epigenetics influenced by environment, influenced by our diet, influenced by a lot of factors that we can change. I think epigenetics offer a great way to link exposure to our gene expression. So back to the notion, we cannot change our gene, but if we behave well, we, if we eat well, if we uh, uh, have uh, like healthy like, environmental exposures, we can modify our gene expression level through the epigenetics, okay, to have a better life and be, uh, uh, have a good well-being. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Han. Uh, I'll go ahead and move on to our second question. Is it a fair criticism of precision molecular slash genomics that we are finding statistical interactions before we better understand if there's a biological interaction? raising the question of biological plausibility. Um, this participant has heard that criticism made, but does not is not sure if they agree with it. Could you clarify that a little bit? Yeah, so here is the catch. The, um, you can test a lot of things in the lab. So to understand the biological mechanism, to understand the biological significance, but it takes so long, okay? You may study a gene in the lab find a biological significance for years, okay? Maybe five years project, maybe 10 years to study a gene. We can't afford this uh, timeline. Using the big data we have, using the genetic approach, especially with the modern technology at affordable price, we can generate a lot of data. We can run the statistical test to screen out a lot of uh, uh, signals with strong uh, statistically significant findings, okay? We can use these findings as a, a guidance to back to the lab to understand biological significance. That's how I and, uh, understand this uh, two-way of uh, uh, approach. I, I think you know there's a lot of biological significance findings may not reach the statistical significance level. A lot of statistical level findings may not have a strong biological basis for it. But I think this is more like a complementary approach rather than one is the winner, the other is the loser. And actually in clinic, you can think a lot of examples without knowing the biological mechanism, we can use those statistical findings for our clinical guidance. So we you know, we know HDL is bad, uh, sorry, LDL is bad, HDL is good, bad cholesterol, good cholesterol, all these markers we can use to predict our disease risk without knowing the function like many years ago. Over time, we understand the biology better, which strengthen the association. We feel more confident to use those markers to predict our disease risk or the treatment effects. So I think it's a complementary. I think we should work together. And uh, there's always good good to understand the biology behind the statistical significance. But with the big data, if we like uh, increase the uh, statistical significance threshold, we can find a lot of highly statistical significant findings. I think they are meaningful. I, I think, you know, clinically we can use this and uh, in the uh, basic science lab, we can understand the function. Thank you for touching on that balance. I think complementary is the perfect way to describe that relationship between uh, biology and statistics kind of informing the other. Um, thank you for touching on 
uh, translation into clinical spaces as well. Um, kind of continuing along uh, the path of feasibility, generalizability, we have a question asking about implementation. Because of the individualized nature of precision health, is there a feasible way to implement it on a wide scale? And if so, what have you seen that's been effective? What have you seen that's maybe not been so effective? So the uh, in the clinical setting, there are a lot of cancer center, for example, our Simon Cancer Center, and also know a lot of cancer center in this nation, they sequenced uh, the cancer patients, the tumor samples. Once they get a cancer patient, they biopsy the tumor, they do the sequencing. So based on the sequencing, they can pick up the different treatment for them or put them in the different clinical trials. Okay, that's the treatment part at, for cancer patient. For the general population, all these genes, different forms of genes you inherit from your parents. There's a commercial company here, for example, the 23 and me in California, you know, you spend like $200, you give your cheek swab, they tell you, oh, they give you the uh, uh, whole genome like a scan and they tell you like mo you're more likely to be a coffee drinker or what kinds of uh, disease risk you have. So they keep, they keep updating their knowledge base based on the current findings and the, the fit you in was, you know, based on the most recent findings, you are more likely or less likely to have this disease or not. So give patient a sense or general uh, population a sense, you know, like uh, where is your genetic susceptibility goes in terms of a different health related outcomes. I think this is the way. I think because you know the way we get a sample is much easier than before. The technology become much cheaper than before. So this is the way to go. But there's a implementation is not easy because there's ethical issue involved in this, social issue involved in this. It will become your personal information. You you know is is influence your health insurance premium in the future, it may influence your employment in the future. So there's a, before we large scale implement all this, we have to understand what's the best for us, how we protect our privacy. And there's a lots of uh, uh, research into this domain, in, in addition to uh, uh, understand the, the genetic ba basis, how about how we use this genetic information to benefit our society. Yeah. So for example, like Alzheimer's disease, APOE, you can do the genetic test, but there's no effective prevention strategy for Alzheimer's disease for now. So should you tell patients about it? This is called, you can predict the disease, but you cannot prevent the disease. So there's a whole lot of research into that domain, but, and, and, but, but fortunately, there are a lot of diseases are preventable. Okay, so if you know you are more likely to have skin cancer, for example, which is my research, you just avoid the sun exposure. So that's the, the, the you know, like uh, the easy e example, but there's a whole lot of uh, research into this domain. Great question. Thank you very much, Dr. Han, and thank you to those who submitted questions. This is going to wrap up our first question and answer session. So we'll go ahead and move into the second part, Dr. Han's presentation. If you have any questions that pop up, you don't need to keep them to yourself until the end. Feel free to just drop them in the chat box and I'll continue monitoring that. Back to you, Dr. Han. Yeah, so the uh, we talk about the lifestyle, we talk about the prevention of the disease, but you know, like uh, that's the, uh, the uh, food intake, lifestyle. How about the, the, the drug intake, chemo prevention, okay? So this is a work from our school, uh, from our department. And um, in general, in the clinic, the uh, physician can give, uh, suggest you take a baby aspirin to prevent colon cancer, okay? This is the uh, routine practice. But it turns out in this particular paper, uh, published in JAMA, have the NIH director of the blog, comments on this particular case. So the data here, this is like a way to show a data briefly. So in, in the general population, 96% of the population have this uh, TT genotype, okay? You have 
over 30% risk reduction for colon cancer. Okay, feel like it fits the traditional like a recommendation. Aspirin help you decrease risk for colon cancer development, but you but the four percent of the population actually, if you take aspirin, is increased risk for colon cancer for you. Another gene we identified is ninety one percent population over thirty percent risk reduction. It's great, but another nine percent, nine percent have no benefit in terms of uh, protection of colon from getting colon cancer. Here again, is risk benefit consideration because there's as aspirin intake can also have some side effects in terms of like, uh, you know, internal bleeding, things like that. So should I take aspirin to prevent my uh, colon cancer? The answer is depends on your gene. If you are in that 4% of the risk population is increase your risk. If you in you in this 9% of population is no benefit for you for colon cancer prevention. So this is a way, not only we talk about a, a drug treatment, this is like a chemo prevention. You take a drug to prevent some disease, there's also genetic accessibility you know, as a background. So we have a different genetic background, give you the totally different answers. Uh, another example we have, like uh, this is the, the uh, study we done by a doctor student in the EPI department, and uh, we surveyed IU students. Okay, we published this paper. We get into the Yahoo News. Say the bottom message is like tanning bad usage cause skin cancer. I think the majority of people understand tanning bath is generated artificial UV uh, ultraviolet and. Uh, make your skin look tanner, but put a lot of damage in your skin, increase risk of skin cancer. But the bottom line for this survey study is like, even though most people know this knowledge, they understand they are at risk of skin cancer. They still won't have the tanning bed exposure. They still want to go for the tanning bed. Okay. Why is that? Because when we are under the sun, we feel happy. We are happy because sun exposure can promote the production of beta endorphin in the tissue of the skin. Why the blood flow is go to the brain, make you feel happy. The beta endorphin is, uh, you can argue this is a hormone, okay? This is the same pathway to make you feel happy when you smoke, when you drink, when you use the uh, opioid drug. It's the same molecular pathway in your brain. So we hypothesize, we, you know, as a human in the evolutionary like a period, we produce this sun-seeking like a behavior because we need to produce enough vitamin D in our body. Without the milk, without the fish intake, the majority of the vitamin D produced in our body is from sun exposure. We get in the sun, our skin produces vitamin D. Vitamin D is very important for our bone health, for our reproductive health, okay? Mom with the low vitamin D level will have a baby with rickets. It's not good for human you know, pass on the next generation for the reproduction, for the bone health. So we generate this mechanism for this sun seeking behavior. Naturally, we feel happy in the sun. We stay longer in the sun. We have a higher vitamin D production. It's good for human. And we are studying this opioid responses at the genetic level now. There are genes or pathways responsible for this sense-seeking behavior. Back to this uh, Precision Health Initiative, IU has been celebrating the 200 years anniversary. In the research side, they come up with, the president office come up with a three round of grand challenges. It's called IU Grand Challenges. The first one is the Precision Health Initiative. 
okay, is $120 million investment in the whole camp, in the whole university to study this precision health. Does, uh, they have a strong research component. They also have a education component. Oh, I take advantage of this uh, uh, video as a, my TV commercial. We have a precision health overview class. Okay. okay, it's a graduate level course. Okay, open to everybody in our school, give you the overview of a precision health. We have a whole bunch of invited speaker to cover the many aspects of precision health. This is a part of the precision health initiative education component. Okay, we work with the campus to generate this course. I think we are also generate the uh, undergraduate level a version of that uh, overview of precision health, uh, hopefully, you know, later this year. And for people at the graduate level who want to take this course, we offer this in the spring, in the winter session now, we will offer another session in the spring semester. So there's a big investment in terms of the research, in terms of the education. And uh, they identify three major cancers to work on. Breast cancer, mainly for triple negative breast cancer, very hard to treat. And the multiple myeloma and the pediatric psychoma. They also identify two diseases to prevent Alzheimer's disease and um, type two diabetes. Back to Tom's question, what's the efforts we have in our department? We have uh, at least three faculty uh, involved in Precision Health in Initiative. Dr. Hume Nan, who published that aspirin paper in JAMA, gets us into the Precision Health Initiative. We get the funding to uh, uh, lead this uh, molecular and a genetic uh, component in the Precision Health Initiative, provide expertise in this domain for, for the group. And using the funding we get, we recruit Dr. Xin Li from EPI department to study the, uh, some molecular and genetic stuff. And she is leading the opioid uh, mediated response for this tanning bed uh, usage. And this is also leads to the opioid crisis uh, grand challenge that we are uh, participating in. And Dr. Jennifer Vessel in our department leading a component in the type two diabetes prevention project. So in addition to these three faculties directly involved in Precision Health Initiative, as I mentioned earlier, other faculty also get into the molecular and genetic component, okay, in their research. For anyone interested in working on the project and work with them, feel free to, to email me. And uh, this is the, the take home message for the today's students, alumni, alumni. So first, if you have spare time, I encourage you to learn some genetic concept or terminology. You don't need to take a course. There's plenty of good uh, uh, materials at the YouTube, Google. I found fascinating things I want to learn. You know, never stop learning something new. If I want to learn something new, I Google it I, or I search on YouTube. There's always a short video you can watch, can understand. You know, they have like a cartoon, they have emanation, so you can learn things quickly because this is something people talk about. You just read the magazine, newspaper, social media, they all kinds of talk about like genetic stuff, precision health stuff. So it's, you want to get familiar with all these terminologies and also participate in some research project. You will have some hands-on experience. You may not get into the, uh, the genetic analysis, but if you become a study coordinator, if you become a project manager, somehow you can, you know, like, contact, you know, have a, like a very good exposure with clinicians, with uh, epidemiologists, they keep talking about this. You can see what the data looks like, how they analyze the data, so how to interpret the results, which is very important. And uh, keep in mind, you know, when people talk about what's precision health, my answer will be one size does not fit all, okay? <laughs> this is very old notion, you know, this is talk about the shoes, okay? It's also talk about many other things. It's also talk about our well-beings. And also remember, 
is the, always the gene exposure interactions. So some people use the uh, uh, an, uh, an allergy is like a, the, the gene is the gun, in, uh, is the, the bullet in our gun. The exposure is the trigger, okay? So you need the gene, you need the exposure, okay? To have a beneficial effect or to have a harm effect. This is COVID-19 time. I didn't talk about too much about the COVID-19. People are sick and tired of like a COVID-19, COVID-19. But if you think about in the general population, some people have a very dramatic different symptoms when they affected the COVID-19, right? So, and think about the vaccine reaction, okay? We have a different uh, reaction in terms of the vaccination. This is also with like genetic component into this, genetic susceptibility into this, okay? So maybe in the future, we have like half dozen type of vaccine based on genetic profile. You should take this vaccine. You should take that vaccine. Even you take the same vaccine, you may have a different dose. You know, people now talk about the second dose, the delayed second dose or multiple dose. This is what I would say will be a very hot area for future research in terms of like infectious disease epidemiology, because understand the genetic background will understand better how this virus get in our body, how our body fight against this virus. Okay. I will end my talk. Thank you for coming and great to see many audience today and uh, I'll be happy to answer more questions. And feel free to email me if you want to me to link any of the faculty or research project. We can help with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Han. I know we've got some time for some more questions here at the end. So anybody who's been holding on to a few thoughts, go ahead. Uh, you can unmute yourself, or if you'd rather, you can submit those in the chat box, and I'll read those off to Dr. Han. Uh, continuing along with examples of precision health, one of the most common ones I know of and that I've seen referenced the most is all of us, uh, the precision health genomics campaign. I know that that one is typically one of the easier ones to get involved with at any level of study across fields because its aim is to build a more representative biomedical database. This is especially helpful um, for precision health in the sense that we are kind of assigning uh, helping clinicians assign treatments, following patients over time, because we are taking those individual characteristics into account, making sure people are represented who typically have not been in the past. Um, could you speak on that a little bit more? Because I know that that may be something that our colleagues have experienced and maybe not known about. Yeah, so this is like sort of like a, a, another way to think about it. Like, well, I do genetic research. I participate all the you know studies like that. I also you know like uh, have my data from twenty three and me. It's fun to look at that, and uh, and also uh, you have to understand uh, when you do this test, uh, you better understand yourself, and you have a, a better treatment option from a clinicians in the future. M more importantly, you also contribute to the research because like all these uh, uh, conclusions we draw is from our population research, from our population data. If you can be part of the data, you can be part of the discovery phase to understand better about the genetics. We understand a lot, but the whole lot we don't understand. If you contribute your sample, not only you benefit yourself, you benefit the future research. The more people participate, the more we better understand, the more like different genetic profile we can identify, the more treatment options or prevention options we can have. So this is certainly a, a, a way to go. So, um, it's not a mandate, but this is a, 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 is a volunteer. And uh, I would uh, suggest people embrace the future. Yeah. Awesome. We do have one question about data. Generally in the precision health program, where is the genomic data originate, originating and or generated from, such as public databases like genome-wide association studies, next generation sequencing, or campus facilities like the Center for Medical Genomics? And are you primarily using genome-wide association studies data 
or more advanced data like next generation sequencing or RNA sequencing? Um, let me think how to answer this question. You can generate the data by yourself. You can generate the data in your own research group. You can also use public available data. Okay, and uh, in this days, NIH suggests you we if we funded by NIH funding, we have to submit our data to DB Gap or other like a public domain, so other people can benefit as well. Okay, so uh, taking myself as an example, I use public available data. I also use some data that is public available, but the request a uh, special approval. Okay, and I also contact my collaborator to ask them share their data with us so we can work together as collaboration. At the same time, I also generate the data myself. You know, like uh, for example, for the genome-wide association data at a DNA level, I collaborate with other people. I download from public available data. Database for the more deep data, as you mentioned, sequencing data, RNA data, I generate from my lab. I I collect some sample from dermatology clinic at IU. It's a smaller data, but we can have a multiple layer of data. We generate next generation sequencing data, RNA profile data. So those data we can identify, you know, something new, you know, like in our own group. Yeah. There's a multiple way uh, to get that data, it's especially uh, what I mentioned, like 23 and me. You can request data from 23 and me. You know, if we get the proof, you will have their data. There's a UK biobank in in uh, uh, UK, so you can request data. One of our doctor students using that data is free. Okay, uh, to have his uh, dissertation to study gene diet interaction. So uh, in the past, it's very hard to get a large scale data, but in these days it's become a very popular and the people more have a consensus to you know, upload their data to the public domain for people to use. Thank you, Dr. Han. Uh, any lingering questions, feel free to submit those or unmute yourself as we head into the conclusion of today's session. All right, I'm not seeing, oh, we've got one. Oh, thank you. All right, so I will go ahead and conclude the session a few minutes early. A good way to kick off the weekend. Thank you all for participating today. This will conclude our discussion. Thank you, Dr. Han, for sharing your insight with us. I think it's particularly interesting to think about everything that qualifies as precision health that we just didn't have a name for. The applications may be new, but the concept certainly is not. I hope you all will join us on February 5th at 12 o'clock for a discussion on global health featuring Dr. Max Moreno and moderated by a doctorate of public health, global health leadership student. Thank you to Dr. Han, Crystal, the IU Alumni Association, and the Fairbanks School of Public Health Alumni Board. Have a great rest of your Friday, everybody.